Rather, if I stretch my imagination here, he might give it to a radiant who I can't see. <gasps> and it's messing up my focus. Okay. Hey, you geeks. After weeks on variations of forecasting doom and gloom, I'm going to make this video a little bit silly, and you'll soon see why. Full spoiler warning for all Tor-released Cosmere content, including slight spoilers for Elantris and Mistborn Era 2. Though it's really nothing on what Hoyd just casually drops in these chapters already, like, come on. However, I will admit my Hero of Ages spoiler is quite the doozy. Words of Wisdom. Let's start with the very first epigraph of these chapters because it's a very good place to start and because it doesn't really fit in with any of Shallan and Dalinar's doings, yet it's important, I do believe. The Almighty has given us the limbs to move and the minds to decide. Let no monarch take away what was divinely granted. The heralds also taught that all should have the sacred right of freedom of movement to escape a bad situation or simply to seek a brighter dawn. The right to travel seems more connected to whatever is going on in Shinovar, the place where they casually bind people to the very land they work. A right that is so honorable, even common Alethi dark eyes have it, though the Lonans do not. Kaladin's family certainly had it. Liren said, Our grandfathers bought and worked us up to the second non, so we could have full citizenship and the right of travel. And yet, implicitly, Zeth's colorful, well-to-do family with the right of leisure does not have the right to travel. Above and beyond being bound to the land, there is the cultural taboo of not walking on stone that basically forbids any Shin person from leaving Shinovar, a land where one of you in the comments pointed out the minutes stretch like fluid and it's all in a drowsy, dreamlike state, making Shinovar seem more like Hotel California. You can check out As we saw, Sanderson dropped the seed very early in The Way of Kings, and yet this plot line has made itself manifest more on the path of Skybreaker Radiance, particularly when Dalinar forced Nail to have a mini flashback last book. Nail said to them, But you can be moral as you create laws. Ever, you must protect the weakest those most likely to be taken advantage of, institute a right of movement so that a family who feels their lord is unrighteous can leave his area, then tie a lord's authority to the people who follow him. The right of movement as described by Nail is the polar opposite of the Shin practice of binding everyone to the farmer and the land he works, especially those who subtract who must follow the will of small stones. Now, this practice, however, seems in keeping with the tradition of the people in darkness of the story of the girl who looked up, where they warn. Why is there a wall? She asked the man selling fruit. To keep the bad things out, he replied. What bad things? Very bad things. There is a wall. Do not go beyond it or you shall die. Thus, the fandom has taken it for granted that honor and cultivation allotted the humans the land of Shinovar. But this doesn't square with Noadon saying that honor himself guaranteed the right of movement. Therefore, perhaps this guarantee to the humans coming to Roshar that they could travel is what the writer of the Aela Steely considered such a betrayal. We took them in as commanded by the gods. What else could we do? They were a people forlorn, without a home. Our pity destroyed us, for their betrayal extended even to our gods, 
to spren, stone, and wind. Beware the other worlders, the traitors. So this seems to be the great question of justice that Nail and the Skybreakers, and Zeph especially, is going to have to face. Is it just to move into another's home when your home is uninhabitable for whatever reason? Power brokers. After chapters of teasing us at the doorway, we are finally in to see the ghost bloods all together in their super secret hideout and revealing their super secret plan, or rather, plans. We should be working on our plan, Icy Tongue said, to transport Stormlight off world. Now that we know it can be blanked of identity and transferred between realms, how does chasing down some ancient spren further Master Thytikar's orders to provide him a renewable source of investiture? First, Icy Tongue's words themselves clarify clearly for the first time on world, expanding on Ray's prior vague promises of Rhythm of War, that Thytikar was just originally interested in exploiting Rosharan Investiture. Now, however, we learn that capturing or releasing or whatever in Ba'edo Mishram was Yatel's idea. However, as it is in the great tradition of Thydekar to mess with ancient gods who exploit people, maybe, he apparently gave this the green light. Master Thydekar will see eventually, Yatel said. He is smarter than you give him credit for. He works to protect his homeland above all else. But once we find Mishram for my purposes, he will see. Master Thydekar can only protect his land if shards can be controlled. I'm not sure how Yatil plans on controlling Ba'ido Mishram, the most crafty of Unmade, when she can, by her own admission, barely control Moraes from developing ulterior motives of promoting his own protégés? Not to mention, there is the woman that Shalon herself is impersonating and her plans that have probably been foiled because of Shalon capturing her, and yet they serve enough just for Shalon's own undoing, because Shalon lacks the basic skills. I predicted last video that Shalon would not be betrayed by an outside force, but rather her own lack of skills. Now I specified it would be improper mask wearing, which was a bust. I should have realized from my childhood that the fundamental rule in order to go out into the world and do noble things for the good of all, you must speak French. I must go into the world and do noble things for the good of all. And you can't come because you don't speak French. I do love that Golden Age Veggie Tales can provide oddly applicable Cosmere commentary at times. However, Iatil, as a Southern Skadrian, probably isn't speaking Cosmere French, but rather Cosmere Scandinavian. And I rather object to the clipped German pronunciation that Kate Redding gives to Iatil's words when they should sound something like this. Hello, I'm the Schmied who went up a hill and came down with all the strawberries. Now, because I learned French so I could go out into the world and do noble things for the good of all, I have no idea what she is saying in Cosmere Swedish. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Shalon doesn't have a clue either, so she answers the name of the big secret surprise guest at the Ghost Blood meetings. Now, kudos to you in the comments section for correctly predicting that the Ghost Bloods would have a surprise guest. It was, with hindsight, fairly obvious that Saj Anat would make her appearance. But in truth, I... Oh, wow. Ooh. Forgot about that one. Team Unmade. Saj Anat's appearance and interactions with the Ghostbloods does confirm the theory that she and they had 
more dealings off-page in Rhythm of War than Sanderson would originally have us believe, as all we really saw was her sort of half-endorsement of Mraze as she assumedly sent Toomey off to the tower. I will go, mother, he said, to the tower, to this man, Mraze, as you have promised. Go then, she said, but do not bond this human because of what I said. I merely promised to send a child to investigate options. There are other possibilities there. Choose for yourself, not because I desire it. Thinking this through, if this spren was to me that is Relaine's future spren, then we know he didn't bond Marais, and if Sajanat was sincere that she wanted someone to bond Marais, then it follows that she could have enlightened another radiant spren, and maybe sent a few other wind spren in gemstones as a distraction. We know that Sajanat is not on anyone's side but her own. Side. I am on nobody's side. Because nobody is on my side. As a rogue agent, she insists that she is doing all these things so that her children may be safe. And yet her own inner perspective reveals that she will willingly... Protect some children, sacrifice others. A choice only a god could make. All this time, I presume that Sajanat takes this attribute of what she believes to be divine from Odium. Yet, after learning about Aeonalsium's primordial spren of Roshar, the rock and the wind, and the very personified beings of the moons who call each other as brother and sister, I am most intrigued that Sajanat in this chapter refers to Mishram as her sister and Honor as a betrayer. Honor is a coward who always hated us, destroyed us, betrayed us. One last warning, however, I do not think you will find an ally in my sister. Mishram is not fond of humans. I do appreciate her little tirade against all the shards in Shallan's head, and yet, if she was looking for a time to reveal that Odium himself is under new management... If you were waiting for the opportune moment, that was it. This revelation that Sajanat gave the Ghostbloods more enlightened spren than previously thought in Rhythm of War, I think lines up nicely with my ongoing theory that it was the Ghostbloods and not Renarin who gave Terabangian the enlightened wind spren in a basket. They wouldn't need to know that Sajanat was making a play for old race. All they saw was an opportunity to gain radiance, power, and now a way to navigate the spiritual realm. Navigation Unlike the Ghostbloods and probably Shallan, Navani and Dalinar are going to do things scientifically and practice going into the spiritual realm before they dive in head first. And they will have wit as investiture coach. First, we'll have you peek into the spiritual realm and see if this even works. If you leave your bodies behind, as I'm hoping, I should be able to bring you back out if you're needed. Once there, I suggest using connection to guide you into a specific slice of the past. I'll help you with that. If that works, we can send you on a longer journey into times I wasn't here to witness. Technically, they won't be diving in at all, but merely using their minds, as it is very dangerous to go into Teleron Riyad in the flesh. Wit seems confident that they will be able to make their way by connection themselves, that is, those disembodied gold lines that Dalinar started seeing during Rhythm of War. Meanwhile, the Ghostbloods seem intent on relying on their spren alone and going in body, mind, and soul. 
The timing will be tight. We need to get into Shadesmar and be ready to enter Dalinar's perpendicularity as soon as it opens. You will not miss your opportunity, Sajinat said, though I question your eagerness to be lost in that place. You said our spread could guide us, Moraes said, stepping closer to the mirror. You said they understood that realm. Like a fish suddenly on land, you will be in a place that is hostile to your existence. My children will guide you, but you still may not return. I do wonder how they're going to get into the spiritual realm, as you certainly need a radiant blade to get there. So, perhaps one of Shallan's ghost bloods is still a traitor after all. Now, if Shallan were to succeed and escape the ghost blood, she would still have time to go warn Dalinar and Navani, or at least Wit, that their plans have been compromised, and they can make an informed decision moving forward. However, this is the rising action. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm voting she is going to get captured by the Ghostbloods now, and only escape enough to dive into the spiritual realm from the cognitive realm after them without any means of navigation. Not even a storming magic compass, dang it, which I find is a real shame. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Share the load. Now seems like an excellent time to return to those epigraphs, particularly the second one and Noadon's musings on giving up power. Farai's king had walked away from my duties, and it was different for me. Had I not renounced the throne the Almighty had granted, and in so doing undermined my very own words, was I abandoning that which was divinely given me? These sentences seem to be in direct conversation with, of all things, what Ajir told Adolin and Oathbringer before he decided to walk away, like Noadon, from the Alethi throne. Of all things I've walked away from, the one I don't regret is allowing someone else to rule. Sometimes the best way to do your duty is to let someone else, someone more capable, try carrying it. Now, if Adolin could learn that lesson from Azure, and he is a chip off the old block, then I wonder if in this book, the old block is going to learn it himself, though provided it's from a more divine source than Azure. As Dalinar waves off Navani's pleads that he finds someone else to shoulder this burden, as he understands it to be his divinely appointed duty. He found such questions ridiculous. Who else could he trust with a problem of such magnitude? Someone needed to walk the difficult roads. And, as ruler, it was his duty. That was what the Way of Kings taught. Perhaps this is the lesson that Dalinar must learn on his journey through wind and truth. How to give up power. Perhaps he will find an honor's investiture with an intent so perverted by its disconnection with humans that it will seek to teach all the Oathbreakers honor in the most brutal way possible. You will learn respect, and suffering will be your teacher. And, or, perhaps Dalinar will believe this shard is so powerful that no one man should bear it, and therefore leave it in the spiritual realm to rot, or perhaps give it to the people. There's thousands of years of world history down there, and it belongs to the world, and everybody in it. But I really struggle seeing him doing that, no matter how much I want it. Rather, let us stretch our imaginations and... Consider that he might give it to a radiant, a radiant who has thrown herself headlong into the spiritual realm with no way home apart from a 
excremental ton of investiture. A radiant who has put herself in this position because she is making up for the faults of her past and those of past radiants. A radiant who knows what it is like to have betrayed family and friends and yet still works to reconcile with them. A radiant daughter of a herald whose very DNA is coded to be aligned with honor's intent. Sure, Kaladin may have old Tanabas's ancient temperament, but it is Shallan who, at best, most closely aligns with whatever messed up situation Honor's investiture finds itself in right now. Yes, this is my aluminum foil hat theory, that if any one ends up with Honor's shard at the end of Wind and Truth, it will be Shalad. Thus, it seems Sanderson is starting a new club, the club for wives who ascend to shardhood just in time to see their husbands die in unwinnable fights club. That's kind of a mouthful and not as pithy as the Dead Wives Club, but I'm workshopping the title. Let me know your suggestions down below. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more. Hope to see you next week. Bye!